the Internet of Things gets complicated, YouTube powers up on gaming, and Facebook tweaks their algorithm again. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 358 for Friday, June 12th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses. To help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills for a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and joining me today to talk about the Internet of Things is Stacey Higginbotham, Senior Editor of Fortune and host of the IoT Podcast. Welcome, Stacey. Thank you. So we've been trying to get you on for a while. You're busy, you tweet so much, you write so much. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on, for making the time. No, I'm really excited. I've just been traveling all over the place, so I'm glad. Well, it's good to have you here. I want to start with an article on money.com uh, that you tweeted about. You didn't write it. It quotes Steve Wozniak as calling the Internet of Things industry a bubble because, he says, there's a pace at which human beings can change the way they do things. Uh, you say he may be right, but to prove the point, money didn't, they, they got the companies wrong. They were looking at the wrong companies. What are the right companies to be looking at right now when it comes to the Internet of Things? Oh, this is scary. So there are so many. Um, I... He looked at Cisco, uh, Sierra Wireless, and some others, and, and those aren't terrible companies. But if we're really talking about the Internet of Things, I think you should probably start at the very first layer of the stack. So that's the chips, right? So you should probably look at Qualcomm. You should look at ARM. You should look, even look at Intel um, and NXP, Atmel, some of those guys. So the MCU vendors, the the CPU ven vendors. And then you should take it up another level to kind of the radio guys. So Silicon Labs is a good one because they do Bluetooth and Zigbee and, oh no, they do Bluetooth, Zigbee and Z-Wave, I believe. Um, and then Qualcomm for the Wi-Fi chips, Broadcom, Marvell. Um, and then you have to start looking at kind of the home control. There's, I think control four is old school. I wouldn't really rely on it. Um, I control Logitech has a great industrial cloud uh, offering. Um, and then there's Amazon. Almost every company that's building a connected device for the home hosts their servers back on Amazon. So they, they're crucial. If Amazon, go, if Amazon goes down, like your whole house would stop working. So, so do you agree that it's a bubble or do you think that uh, it's, it's going to happen and happen fast, this internet connected everything? I think the challenge that it's a real challenge to get people to change the way they do things. So the real issue is making it less complicated so people don't realize they're changing. And so in one way he's right, but in 95% of the ways I feel like he's totally wrong because we're not actually talking about like a moment in time. We're talking about a fundamental shift. It's kind of like the industrial revolution. You wouldn't say the industrial revolution is doomed to fail. Right. So, I mean, they're 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 pushing Nest at Target. I mean, they, they are pushing these devices to the average person, uh, not just to geeks. Um, but then, you know, you look at some of the newest HomeKit devices, and they don't look that easy. And it's it's sort of complicated for what the ones that have been revealed what they'll do. I mean, it's a lot of setup just to get Siri to dim your lights. Uh, what do you think? Is is it too complicated for the average person? So, what we've seen so far, like for the whole systems are pretty complicated. The one-off devices are getting it. They're, they're doing actually a really good job. And that's why I was actually super excited last year when Apple announced HomeKit because I'm not really a huge Apple fan, but they have the skills to like make the programming and the hard levels of getting things to work together. They have the market share and the skills to make that like easy for consumers. But so far, I think they're not, they're failed. Well, you've written a lot about HomeKit, um, specifically that the devices have been delayed, even though Apple denies that they've been delayed. And then there was this kerfuffle recently with the Echo B connected thermostat. Um, those are the units that, that people have bought, and even just in the past few months, and they just learned that they won't be home ca HomeKit compatible. Uh, what do you think is going on there? Again, this is such a fast-moving space. So what Apple wanted to do was 
make products that were really secure and easy to get to from your phone. So once something was on your Wi-Fi network, they wanted you to be able to access it without like having to sign in your multiple passwords, SSIDs and all of that stuff. So they were using the, the WAC program, which is the, what is it? I'm trying to remember what WAC stands for and I can't, uh, but it's, it's for the made for iPhone program. So they took kind of the rules of that game and applied it to the internet of things. And that requires special hardware. And if your hardware didn't ship with that special chip inside, it's, going to be really difficult to be certified basically for HomeKit. And I'm betting that for big partners like Philips Hue, which are everywhere, maybe Apple's going to do something so it doesn't have to be certified with the hardware. So you won't have to replace your hardware, but we're not even sure on that because the Philips Hue lights that are HomeKit certified won't even come out till September. Right. And there was also the promise that uh, a lot of these devices could be uh, controlled by Apple TV when we're away from the house, but then we're not sure when the newest Apple TV will be released either. So it seems to be a little bit of a confusing space there. So. It's, it's a total, it's a total muddle when people are like, what should I buy? Uh, I'm like, oh, just pick a device you like and buy that. Don't, don't try to automate your entire home. You're just going to be frustrated. Right. Uh, so you have an article on Fortune this week called Here's Why Companies Need to Think Bigger When It Comes to Connected Devices. Um, and it was a really good read. I recommend people, who, if they're interested at all, to read this. Um, and you write, I found a lot of interesting things in your article. One thing about you write about how you found a new use for security cameras. Um, you say that uh, you had one set up in your house and uh, that when items like jackets or lunch boxes turned up missing, you would check the video feed to see if the missing jacket was even in your hands when you came in the front door. I think this is brilliant. Another way computers are smarter than our memories. Uh, what other uses have you found for these devices? Oh, goodness. Um, most of them, I'm trying to think that's kind of a shock. Um, most of them have become ways to check in on my family. So when I'm traveling, like last week I was in San Francisco, and I don't have any cameras that face the inside of my house, only cameras that we've tried, they face outside kind of to the front door. Um, so I can't like look in on my family, but I can like look at the nest from my phone and see that the temperature's up. So people are probably home or I can see if they're away. Um, on the garage door, I have managed to, I have a remote controlled or a internet connected garage door and I will open the garage door so people can put packages inside the garage door when they get to my house. That's kind of the same normal use case. So, and my daughter, she loves, she's eight and she loves finding kind of crazy new uses for things. So I, I'm trying to think like. Well, you said she, uh, like she, she knows you're watching, then she'll do a dance for you so that you can see, which I think is nice. <laughs> She, and we just we just tested out this uh, doorbell. It's a video connected doorbell, so it's called the it's called Ring. Mm -hmm. um, and when you ring it, you open up a video and microphone connection, a video and audio feed, basically to whoever's at the doorbell. And so, if I when I was out of town, she would sometimes just ring the doorbell to try to talk to me, um, <laughs> and that was kind of fun. Uh, yeah, I have three kids too, and they are always they they are the ones that are finding the new use for the, this. I don't know if your children you have an Echo, I know. So my kids have found all kinds of crazy uses for it. Their favorite thing is just to add uh, random things full of sugar to my shopping list. I don't know if your kids have figured that out yet. Your daughter, <laughs> we have it. I just actually today Echo got um, a few more if this and that triggers, mm -hmm. and so I just made a dance party playlist for my daughter. So she loves. Oh, it's terrible. She loves asking the Echo to play, oh, the Pitbull and Kesha song. Timber, that's the name of the song. So she's like, play Timber like a thousand times in a row. So now the next time she says it, our few lights in the living room are going to do a color loop. So it's going to be like, surprise. That is a perfect use. Yes, my 10-year-old twin boys like to annoy my 12-year-old daughter by having uh, the Echo play the chicken dance. That is what they have designed, so. I don't even want to know that it knows that. <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> so uh, you were talking about how your, you use your security camera to find to help you find lost things. You also have a great article on Fortune about a company that is trying to help you find lost things called Tile. Uh, tell us a little bit about that company. Oh, sure. Tile is one of like, 
there are dozens of these companies out there, but it's a Bluetooth tracking company. So it's about, I think it's like, it's about $20 per tile. So there's, uh, you guys can see the tile right there. It's got a little Bluetooth radio in it. And if you've got the app on your phone, you put the tile on something like your keys. And if you lose your keys or you can't find them, you press an app on or press a button on the app and it's, it makes noise. So you can find your keys. And if you have lost your keys, like you can't find them anywhere, you mark the item is lost in the app. And then anybody in the entire world who has a tile, their phone will start looking for your particular tile. Does that make sense? It, so someone, you're crowdsourcing your lost things. <laughs> yes. Right. And, and basically, the more people who have a tile, the faster it is and more likely it is that you would find the lost object. Although, because it's Bluetooth, that means that, you know, you still can be some distance away. So if it's a really small thing and like you've lost your wallet and it's somewhere in a trash can on the street, this may not help you a whole lot. <laughs> well, of course, this uh, makes me think, a couple of the things you've said have made me think of the ways that um, bad people can use all of these internet of things, connected devices to find things about us. And I know you've talked a lot on your podcast about security, um, but you know, when you were talking about, oh, here's how the ways I know when my um, family's home and, you know, uh, it makes me think immediately, well, other people will uh, also know <laughs> when your family's home and not home. Uh, and, and with this, I thought, um, well, I don't know if I want someone else to find my keys. That's a stranger. <laughs> so in tile, and I actually wanted to put one on my dog's collar to kind of create like a, a little GPS network without all the expense and hassle of a GPS radio on my dog's collar. Um, so they would let me know when they've last seen her. Um, but security wise, letting someone else find your keys, I believe you in the app, when your tile is found, you actually get a screenshot of where it is. So the other person doesn't actually, like the random stranger who's finding your keys, they're not actually getting your keys. Uh, and they don't know where you live. Or where your car they don't, is parked. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't know where you live or where your car is parked. Or whether it's a Tesla or, you know, a 1970 um, VW. <laughs> you know, 1970 VWs are actually... That's true. <laughs> they're a nice car. People want those. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so let's go back to the Echo. Um, uh, you say you love yours. I, I love mine. Uh, people ask me a lot, is it worth it? I think now it's $200. Uh, I think that's what the price is now. If you're not a Prime member, maybe 150 if you're a Prime member. Um, and, right. and I'm not really sure that it is worth that uh, price tag. I say, you know, unless you don't already have a Bluetooth speaker, this would be good, or, you know, a Sonos player. Now, you said in a tweet that you suggested that Amazon should buy Sonos. Uh, what do you think the um, connection there would be? Why do you think that would be a good connection? So the second I got the Echo, and this was all the way back in, like, December. I don't know how I got lucky, but I did. Uh, so... I wanted to control, instead of telling Amazon, like play Timber, for example, I wanted to have access to all of my music. And the best way for me to have access to all of my music in all of my rooms would be to have the Echo actually control the Sonos, which is already hooked up through the internet to Spotify, Pandora, and my own media server in my house. Um, so that's kind of, because I have, I have six Sonoses in my house, I'm a huge Sotos fan. I would love to be able to turn all of those basically into a portal to the Echo natural language processing. So the speech recognition that the Echo has and then having the speaker and then ideally a mic that, so they basically turn into Echoes. That, that would be great. You should cut that idea. Could, <laughs> they, well, I'm like, they should just buy it. Amazon has money. Sonos in Sonos is actually trying to build an API. So there's still hope that we might get to that. And I would settle just for controlling the Sonos in all honesty, but I would really like to be able to tell Alexa, you know, Alexa, play Bob Dylan in the living room. Now, and, now everyone who's listening just got to listen to Bob Dylan too. <laughs> they have. We, that happens a lot in our podcast. We get, yes. we get people who are like, every time you say it, my Alexa turns on. <laughs> right. So uh, I, you, you say you've already used, you've already just found more things you need to buy that you know you can buy on Amazon uh, 
so obviously they, it's working for you. Um, I, I also the Amazon Dash buttons. You've written about those. I, I think both of these things were designed because of the problems. I don't know if you were ever used to subscribe and save, but I was a big fan of that since the beginning. Um, but then I found myself just completely overwhelmed with toilet paper and soap and other things because I just had miscalculated. So I think uh, based on this, it, you know, it would be nice just to be order things when I needed them and not have them come at this regular level, you know, this interval that Amazon decided to. Do you want all these dash buttons in your house? This is something people always complain about to me. I wouldn't mind one on my, um, you know, on my washing machine, but in the rest of the house, probably not. Okay. <laughs> I, I, well, I've been thinking about where would I want the connected button in the washing machine would be good, but I use like three different types of laundry detergent plus like dryer sheets. So do I really want four of those? What I'd rather have is a washing machine that, you know, gives me the option that can, that already knows that it's running out of soap or dryer sheets and then orders it for me. Right. And that's kind of like the Dash replacement service, yeah. which I am super high on. Yay. <laughs> So uh, all of this week I've been hearing about the June Smart Oven, the $1,500 oven that uh, will know how to cook your food better than you do. You did some research on that. Uh, should I buy it? <laughs> oh, man. So it made me cookies, and I've seen the oven in person, and it is very nice. I don't know if I would buy it. I mean, it's a lot of money. You already probably have an oven. And a lot of the features that are in there, I feel like if they work out well in like, like, and that's a big if, because that's a lot of electronics being subjected to a lot of really high temperatures. Um, I, I think Samsung or GE or somebody could really you put a lot of these features into other ovens and you could just get a full-sized oven that has a camera inside and LED lights. So those, those are its biggest features, the camera and the LED light? <gasps> Oh, okay, no. So the, there's three features that are, this is what your $1,500 gets you. Uh, there's a camera inside the roof of the oven and the camera actually is not just any old camera. It, it speaks to a GPU, a graphics processor inside the oven that does machine learning to identify what kind of food you've put in the oven. Eventually it'll even learn like how long you like things cooked or how long things should be cooked for um, on its own, like how a chicken looks when it's properly roasted. Um, it also has an integrated thermometer that you stick inside the, the meat or you probably wouldn't stick it in the cookies. Um, and then it has sensors in the feet of the oven and those sensors act, turn the oven into a scale. So if you put your roast in, the oven can tell A, that this is a pork roast it can tell how cool the temperature, how cool the roast is when you put it in the oven. And it also weighs how much it is. So it actually can cook it on its own. You don't have to set a timer. You don't have to set the temperature or anything. It's like, oh, boom, pork roast, two pounds of it. It started at, you know, 68 degrees. I'm going to do it for this long at this temperature. And then it just happens. It looked like it also might take your picture and, of your food and post it on Instagram for you, which would be nice. <laughs> I think it totally could do that. I, I'm like, that is not a feature that I am looking for. But you can, I do like the fact that you can look at it, the picture on the app. So like if you have guests over, you don't have to keep running to the oven and be like, oh, is it done yet? Is it done yet? Yeah. You can just look. That would be nice. Uh, so finally, I wanted to talk to you about something else that you tweeted today, uh, a website called Unfit Bits, which amused me for a while. It shows how easy it is to convince your tracking device that you're exercising when you're not. So there it is. It looks like a, maybe a Fitbit or maybe a... Oh, do the drill. The drill is way better. <laughs> so and you got to scroll down. Yeah, I think that uh, we had... And so you, you talk about this as being... Um, here, here's the drill. We'll... <laughs> that's that's gonna be me i'm gonna be watching orange is the new black while, while holding my drill and just letting it go <laughs> so it, 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 it is funny but or you put it on your dog or on my kids as i um was talking about earlier my kids wear my dad's apple watch around so that he gets the um the points on his uh, uh for his calories for the day um but you know it's funny but it's also a lot of companies are using uh fitbits giving them away and saying you know giving people benefits and insurance benefits for how fit they are. Uh, but, 
you know, what this points out is that, you know, just one of the problems with connected devices is you really don't know who, who or what it's connected to. True. Now, algorithms are going to get better. So if you stick it on a dog, I bet it'll figure it out. If you stick it on a kid, they may figure it out. If you stick it on the drill, <laughs> I got to think that it's going to figure it out or it's going to be like, call, call 911. This person's falling down a flight of stairs. <laughs> right. Um, so I think this is a problem that'll sort of solve itself. I mean, we've had actually uh, this, I think it was at one of our conferences probably about two years ago, it was our structured data conference. We had someone from the I think it was the CIA who actually said that intelligence agencies can tell, identify people based on their Fitbit data, like how they walk. So it's not crazy to think that as our sensors get better, that we will have personal identifiers that an algorithm can be like, oh, this is Stacy, or oh, the, what the heck happened? Stacy's totally deviating from her normal pattern. Right. So we're going to become, you know, those uh, Stepford wives because we, we want, you know, our devices have told us what kind of people we are and we have to continue being like them, I guess. See, now I, I totally disagree with that because I, I feel like there are days when I don't get my steps or I eat too many calories. That's probably every day. Um, or I write a story that I feel is like totally amazing and then nobody reads it. So I, the page views aren't great. And I look at the data and I'm like, man, I should feel like really terrible today. This should be a crap day for me. But maybe I did something else that isn't isn't accounted for, that the data just doesn't reflect right. And I'm like, nope, I feel great. <laughs> I I managed to walk the dog and I managed to get all this stuff done. And maybe I got a work in and it work out in. It just wasn't a step heavy workout. So I rock. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I feel like there's gonna be plenty of room for personal agency, hopefully. Yes. That is true. Yeah, it, it, that it's just because it doesn't do all the things doesn't mean it can't do some of the things, right? That was very profound. <laughs> I try. That's the one moment of profundity a day. Well, thank you so much. Stacey Higginbotham is a senior editor at Fortune. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter. Uh, is there anything else that you're working on that you're allowed to talk about? I was going to say Wink is for sale, which oh. is, yeah, I don't want to like, but that's a big thing. And for people who it kind of talks to the problems of the space being like so early because a bunch of people bought Wink platforms and it's really unclear if it gets bought, what happens? If it doesn't get bought, what happens? So they're the it's, part of uh, Quirky, the company, and they're selling them off, just just that part. Just Quirky has put, Quirky is changing its business model to be, to not manufacture physical goods anymore. Um, and they're apparently raising funding. This was an exclusive we had today. And the Wink platform is for sale. And yeah, that's kind of what we know right now. And Wink had some security problems at some point, but they've cleared all that stuff up. I hope so. They did have, <laughs> back in April, they, they basically did a security update that broke the devices and you couldn't connect to the internet with them. And some people actually had to physically mail their Wink hubs back in to get them to be fixed and then sent back to them. So for like six days or whatever, they couldn't control their home, which, you know, that would be irksome. <laughs> it would be. Well, you can read that whole exclusive article on uh, Fortune. Um, and thank you so much for joining us, Stacey. Have a good night. I, I will. You guys too. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Coming up, some Android devices still work for making phone calls and 13 little drones that won't break the bank. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is the place for anyone to learn anything about business, software, technology, and creative skills that help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Maybe you want to take better photos, learn to code, max, master Excel, or publish an ebook. lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. And most of us could use a little tune-up on our business skills. Lynda.com has some new courses, including operations management fundamentals, using customer surveys to improve service, how to present and stay on point, and communicating with confidence, which includes a little section on the power of the pause. 
very powerful. With a lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of video courses on demand, complete with transcripts, which allow you to follow along or search for an answer and skip to that point in the video. You get unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. So whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2, and we thank them for their support. Now on to a few more headlines we're following today. Google is shaking up one of the fastest growing forms of entertainment. That's people watching other people play video games. Today, the company announced that this summer they're launching YouTube Gaming in the U.S. and the U.K. YouTube Gaming will be a service and a standalone app designed to streamline all of the YouTube gaming's, YouTube's gaming content. So that's where you find gaming videos, live streams, and other community features, including 25,000 pages dedicated to different games. They also said they'd be making their live streaming tools easier for broadcasters to use. The service looks like a direct competitor to the live streaming game site Twitch, which was bought by Amazon and currently hosts more than 45 million gamers every month. Now, Twitch responded to this news with a tweet directed at YouTube Gaming. It said, welcome Player two. Nice. There it is. <laughs> Next week the big is the big gaming conference E3 in LA. We'll be covering all the announcements right here on the show. And in other news today, the company created another Google News today. The company created a site designed to help you find the perfect Android phone for you. First, just search for the Android phone picker in Google or check the link in our show notes. To get started, tell the site what you like to do most with your phone. Take pictures, listen to music, express your style, talk on the phone. What? People talk on their phones? I don't even know what that means. Then you go through the prompts and the site will recommend which Android phone is for you. And today, Facebook announced a tweak to their newsfeed algorithm that will take into account how much time you spend on particular stories. Now, as a person who spends more time than she plans to on Facebook every day, I will tell you that the algorithm that decides what I'm looking at is endlessly fascinating to me. Viewer Dennison Berkeley recommended Eli Pariser's The Filter Bubble. It's a book about what the internet is hiding from us. Pariser makes the point that it's difficult to like stories about wars or famine or other horrible things, and that Facebook's algorithm is set up to show you more of what you like, which means that we tend to see less serious news. But today, Facebook says they're changing that. They're updating news feeds, ranking factor in a new signal. They're adding a new signal, which is how much time you spend viewing a story in your news feed. And today in drone news, Parrot announced 13 inexpensive new mini drones, including the hydrofoil drone, which is a boat powered by a drone the hydrofoil will cost 110 dollars and like all parrot drones you control it with your phone through bluetooth there are also some new flying drones with top speeds of 11 miles per hour these can only fly for nine minutes at a time but they've managed to reduce charging time to just 25 minutes and finally who is going to win the virtual reality and augmented reality games will it be facebook's oculus rift who've teamed up with microsoft's xbox where does that leave Microsoft's own upcoming augmented reality plans for HoloLens? And what about the Google-backed Magic Leap that pops up in the news cycle every few months but never seems to have anything to show for it? Today, another player jumped into the fray, one that makes perfect sense for this game. It's Industrial Light and Magic, Skywalker Sound, and Lucasfilm. Those are the folks behind the Star Wars films, in case you just woke up from a 40-year nap. Today, they announced ILM Experience Lab to create immersive entertainment experiences. And there they are. I am very excited about that. I am a huge fan of the BB-8, as we just showed. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. If you like the show, leave a comment on iTunes or Stitcher or any place that will let you leave a comment. You can tell your friends, your neighbors, your boss, your employees, tell everyone. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.